Thank you all very much uh, for being here. Um, our, our next uh, witness is uh, Mr. Chad Holliday. Mr. Holliday was the CEO of DuPont until his retirement on January 1st of this year uh, and now serves as the chairman of its board. He is also the past chairman of the Business Roundtable's Task Force on Environment, Technology and Economy for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. He co-authored the book Walking the Talk, The Business Case for Sustainable Development. Mr. Holliday, uh, we welcome you. Uh, please begin when you uh, feel comfortable. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. We appreciate you taking time for our position. I, I do come here in, in two roles. I, I come as the chairman of DuPont and also a member of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, a group of companies and NGOs who have come together to forge a consensus view regarding U.S. action on climate change issue. Mr. Holley, could you move the microphone in just a little bit closer? Okay. Yeah, to, to, to come together w with a climate change view, we've put together this blueprint, which I think you're familiar with, that, that it was the result of two years of work of, of discussing greatly the different options. And I believe that's been very useful. And we're very glad to see that you have taken this into account in the bill that's before us today. We look forward to working with you and your colleagues to further improve the bill as you advance through this legislative process. DuPont's approach to greenhouse gas reductions is informed by our experience with chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, in the 1980s. When atmospheric research on the role of CSCs, we became actively involved in what's called the Montreal Protocol. This international agreement allowed us to phase out of the use of ozone-depleting substances while providing adequate time and market signals to develop effective alternatives. These reductions also had great greenhouse gas uh, benefits. The, the reductions from the Montreal Code Protocol were six times greater than the full reductions from the Kyoto Protocol if it was fully enacted. So what we've seen from this experience is great benefits can come from this kind of activity. I am very proud of my company's work in that, and I'm also very proud of our country's work in making that a success. As DuPont's become more aware of the potential business and environmental implications of climate change, we've looked for ways to contribute solutions. Since 1990 to 2004, we've reduced our own greenhouse gas emissions by 72 percent, while every project returned a positive return to our shareholders. We did it by using what we call an internal cap and trade mechanism that mirrored what a cap and trade would do in the external environment inside, allowing the resources to flow to the very best projects. We think that's critical as we do something across the entire economy. Yet I want to be clear, voluntary efforts are not enough by themselves. We need a program that will focus the uh, work and resources on the best opportunities while we drive the lowest cost, and that will take legislation across our entire economy. I firmly believe this is an opportunity for American industry to reinvent itself. There has never been a bigger opportunity that's more perfectly sized to what American companies, American universities can come together and make happen. So we are, are uh, fundamentally behind this approach, and we believe it will have very positive long-term impact to our overall economy. USCAP is this diverse coalition I described earlier, and we've worked hard to resolve very difficult issues with our different perspectives from NGOs and companies from different industries that we think has been very helpful. We have made substantial progress, but we'd be the first to say we have not answered all the questions. And we're very glad to see that you've included much of this in the work that you, you have before us today. We are pl pleased to see this taking great uh, forward steps, and we look forward to working with you as, as we go forward to hopefully come out with something that has the same power as the Montreal Protocol did once before. And creating an effective climate change program will not be easy, but it's necessary, and the discussion is, is moving in the right direction. We, we appreciate all the steps that you're doing to make this success, and, and we believe these, these steps will, must be very aggressive and, and must recognize and encourage early actions for it to be very successful. Uh, many companies have taken early actions, and undoubtedly there will be a start date to whatever legislation you end up with. 
the last thing we want is all action to stop until that start happens. So, so including early action is very critical. We must also encourage innovation, research, development, demonstration, and deployment programs throughout the entire spectrum of our economy to make it a success. We believe that will be the best way to ensure that consumers are not unduly burdened by this bill. And we must use policy tools and offsets to keep the cost of the program manageable while achieving our long-term goals. In closing, I refer to an old saying I think you must know very well. We must lead, follow, or get out of the way. Gentlemen, this is a time our country should lead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holliday, uh, very much. Our next witness is Mr. Red Cavaney, uh, Senior Vice President for Government and Public Affairs for Conoco Phillips. Mr. Cavaney is the former President and Chief Executive Officer of the American Petroleum Institute and American Plastics Council. Um, he has served on the senior White House staffs of Presidents Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, and Richard Nixon. Uh, welcome, Mr. Cavaney. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Barton, and members of the committee. On behalf of ConocoPhillips and our Chairman and CEO, Jim Mulva, I'm pleased to participate in this important hearing. ConocoPhillips supports the development of a comprehensive national climate protection program that addresses greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time ensuring the supply of secure and affordable energy that is necessary for our nation's continued economic recovery and future growth. We believe the integrated set of policy recommendations contained in the U.S. CAP Blueprint for Legislative Action represents a viable path forward to this end. I have been asked to offer U.S. CAP's insights on options to reduce the impact of climate policy on transportation fuel consumers. In addition, I will touch on some policy areas that are of particular interest to ConocoPhillips and our industry. Our company recognizes that public policy to address climate change will come at a cost to U.S. consumers and businesses. But we believe that in the long run, the benefits to the overall American economy will outweigh these costs. However, in these challenging economic times, individuals and companies may not take much comfort in the promise of future benefits as they struggle to make a mortgage payment or to make payroll. This is why U.S. CAP believes it is critically important that any climate change policy includes provisions aimed at dampening the impact of policy on both consumers and businesses. As a major provider of transportation fuels to the U.S. consumer, ConocoPhillips is keenly aware of how sensitive most consumers are to increases in the price of gasoline at the pump. To address the impact of climate policy on transportation fuel consumers, U.S. CAP recommends the judicious use of allowance value to ensure the consumer's transportation fuel impacts from allowance prices are generally proportionate to their electricity and natural gas impacts. Allowance value for transportation consumers could be applied over a range of options that reduce transportation fuel consumption. The impact of climate policy on companies that produce and deliver transportation fuels will also have implications for the consumer. Under the provisions of the discussion draft, the U.S. refining sector would face a multi-billion dollar annual compliance obligation while serving an accounting function for the government as the point of regulation for the end user's transportation fuel emissions. This would be in addition to our compliance obligations associated with our own greenhouse gas emissions, with the current renewable fuel standard, and with any low carbon fuel standard in the future. Based on the scale of our potential compliance burdens, we're deeply concerned about our ability to fully pass on these costs, given the potential implications that even a small percentage of unrecoverable costs could have a on this historically low margin business. The consequences of not getting the policy right could be premature reduction in U.S. refining capacity, additional increases in gasoline prices, rising transportation, fuel imports, and further loss of American jobs. We stand ready 
to offer constructive suggestions for fair and equitable carbon uh, allowances, for improving the low carbon fuel standard included in the discussion draft, and in a variety of areas from cost containment to market oversight to incentives for carbon capture and storage. Based on the recent and ongoing work of the committee, we are encouraged by the potential of a path forward that could gain broad support both within the halls of Congress and in homes across the land. We commend the comprehensiveness with which Chairman Waxman and Chairman Markey are approaching this legislation and their careful consideration of U.S. CAP's blueprint for legislative action. In closing, Mr. Chairman, and on behalf of ConocoPhillips, I thank you for your leadership and for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. We look forward to continued work with your committee on this very important matter. Thank you, Mr. Cabinet, very much. Our next witness is Mr. Jim Rogers. He is the uh, CEO of uh, Duke Energy Group. Mr. Rogers uh, has more than 20 years of experience as a chief executive officer in the uh, electric utility industry. Uh, in addition to his position with Duke Energy, he is the chairman of the Edison Foundation and co-chair of the Alliance to Save Energy. Uh, we welcome you back, Mr. Rogers. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Could you turn on the microphone, please? Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chairman Waxman, Chairman Markey, Ranking Members Barton and Upton, and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Jim Rogers, CEO of Duke. I am delighted to be here today and delighted to have an opportunity to support and discuss the discussion draft before us. More than 30 years ago, I started my career as a consumer advocate fighting rate increases of utility companies. I sit here today as a consumer advocate on behalf of the 11 million customers that we provide electric service to in five states. Also as a consumer advocate for those consumers in the 25 states where more than 50% of the electricity comes from coal. To supply our customers, we're the third largest generator of electricity in this country, third largest coal, third largest nuclear. We have a very diverse mix of, of coal, nuclear, natural gas, hydropower, and we reflect much of the mix of generation in this country. We also have invested in renewables such as wind. We have 500 megawatts under operation, 5,000 megawatts under development in the western United States. We're also investing in biomass, where our goal is to build 10 to 12 50 megawatt biopower plants uh, throughout the U.S. over the next five years. I have been an early advocate, longtime advocate for climate change legislation. I was a founding member of U.S. CAP. In our business, we plan for 40 to 50 years. And one of the reasons that I've been such a supporter of clear legislation on carbon is so that I have the certainty that it would allow me to plan. I would have the certainty with respect to the roadmap forward. And most importantly, because we're the third largest emitter of CO2 in the country, I recognize that I am part of the problem and that we need to be part of the solution. And as I look out over the next period of time, between now and 2050, we recognize that every plant that we own and operate today will be retired and replaced. So if the mission is to provide low carbon generation in the future, we can do that. But we need to get started now with the clear path forward. And so I appreciate the work that y'all have done in bringing this discussion draft forward at this time. But while I support climate change legislation, I also recognize the importance of getting the carbon legislation right. So it works not only for the environment, but also for our customers. I know how difficult it is to achieve the right balance. U.S. CAP's blueprint was developed after years of difficult discussions and seemingly endless negotiations. We are pleased the discussion draft includes many of our key recommendations from the blueprint, including a market-based economy-wide cap-and-trade program, a cap trajectory that falls within the blueprints recommendations, although I would note the early caps are on the aggressive end of the range, or as someone has said, they kind of hit the goalpost. Um, it, it provides for cost containment mechanisms such as offsets, banking and borrowing, and multi-year compliance. 
It also provides provisions for research and deployment of carbon capture and storage to ensure coal remains a choice. The environment is indifferent as to how the allowances are distributed. Consumers and businesses are not. Timetables and targets, in my judgment, assure the environmental integrity of the bill. The key is in the transition. Of course, the elephant in the room is the missing section on how allowances will be allocated, a critical issue for many of us at the table, and most importantly, for our customers. And I know that y'all plan to work on this because there's much work that needs to get done to make this a reality. The other thing that I would point out is, is that it is critical that to get this transition right. And we at US CAP spend a lot of time focusing on that and within the blueprint are specific provisions that really address how we make the transition and why getting the transition right is so critical. In closing, I would briefly mention nuclear power. Earlier today, Secretary Chu mentioned it and his support for it. Any serious long-term carbon reduction plan is an empty plate unless we as a nation commit to building zero emission nuclear power plants. Other countries meeting carbon reduction commitments will be relying on nuclear and we shouldn't count it out. In concluding, we believe it won't be cheap, it won't be easy, it won't be quick, but it must be fair and legislation must be now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, very much. Our next witness, Ms. Frances Beinecke, is the president of the Natural Resources Defense Council and is on the steering committee of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership. She has worked with NRDC for more than 30 years and has held leadership roles in several other environmental organizations. Uh, we welcome you uh, back before this panel, Dr. Beinecke, whenever you thank feel you comfortable, much. please um, begin. Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify today on this Earth Day as a member of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership. I'm Francis Beinecke, President of NRDC. Chairman Waxman and Markey and Ranking Members Barton and Upton, thank you for holding this hearing on the American Clean Energy and Security Legislative Proposal. The ACES discussion draft is an excellent starting point for enacting comprehensive energy and climate legislation this year. Passing effective climate legislation to address the imminent threat of global warming is NRDC's highest priority, and it's vital to enact legislation as quickly as possible. We've known for several years that the scientific data on global warming points towards urgent action, and now the economic data is telling us uh, that action is required as well. Rather than a reason for delay, the current recession amplifies the importance of acting quickly. If this act were enacted tomorrow, millions of clean energy jobs would be created starting right away. And we anticipate there'll be minimum e increased energy costs in the near term because the limits on carbon emissions proposed in this would not go into effect until 2012. And by that time, the current recession should be in the rear view mirror. Inaction is simply not an option. Carbon regulation is moving forward. Last week, the EPA acted on what the law and science require and formally found what we have known for many years, that carbon dioxide emissions endanger public health and the environment. Congress has the opportunity to shape how uh, carbon is controlled going forward, and this committee is uh, at work at it right now. If we delay and emissions continue to grow, it will become much harder to avoid the worst impacts of climate gone haywire. In short, a slow start means a crash finish with steeper and more costly emission cuts required for each year of delay. If we enact legislation this year, we can unleash American innovation and tackle this global challenge right now. Today, I want to focus on three critical issues, allocation of allowance value, cost containment, and international action. The allocation of the allowance value is a major issue for the committee to consider and was a central component of the U.S. Climate Action Partnership blueprint for legislative action. U.S. CAP strongly endorses an approach for distributing emission allowances that leads to achieving public objectives and not private windfalls. 
USCAP believes that we can jumpstart the transition to a clean energy economy without creating undue burdens on consumers by initially distributing a significant portion of the allowances to capped entities and economic sectors particularly disadvantaged by the, secondary, by the secondary effects of a cap. This free distribution should be phased out over time with a transition to a full auction. The blueprint identifies principles to guide the fair and equitable allocation of allowances. First, they should go to end-use consumers of electricity, natural gas, and transportation fuels. Specifically, a significant portion should go to re regulated electric and natural gas distribu local distribution companies, LDCs, on behalf of their customers, particularly in the early years of the program. The overall cost of achieving our environmental goals will be minimized if utilities use this value first to ensure that they are investing in all cost-effective energy efficiency opportunities and then rebate the remaining value to their consumers in a transparent manner. Second, allowances should be given to energy-intensive industries with trade-exposed commodity products that face international competition, such as cement and steel. And this will limit the outsourcing of U.S. jobs and the outsourcing of U.S. emissions. Third, allowances should also be allocated for competitive power generation generators, low-income consumers and worker transition and training, programs that drive low-emission technologies to commercial viability, programs to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, 20 percent of emission sources, and adaptation needs of vulnerable people and ecosystems at home and abroad. Previous major environmental initiatives, such as controlling sulfur dioxide emissions, have proved far less costly to accomplish than predicted. Nonetheless, there is uncertainty about the cost of reducing global warming uh, pollution, and that's why the U.S. CAP blueprint addresses cost containment. Although there are some material differences, the ACES discussion draft reflects many of the measures discussed in the blueprint. These include a broadly inclusive cap, emissions trading, unlimited banking of allowances, and effective multi-year compliance periods. The discussion draft also includes a larger role for emission offsets, provided that they meet, and I think this is crucial, strong environmental quality standards. Finally, the discussion draft includes a strategic offset and allowance reserve pool intended to prevent allowance price spikes by releasing addition offsets and or borrowed allowances into the market in the event of exclusive, excessively high allowance prices. The third issue I want to discuss briefly is international action. It's critical that the United States provides a path forward in the international uh, discussions as we lead towards Copenhagen in the fall. And uh, we need to provide key tools in the legislation to aid our climate negotiators in delivering a strong global warming solution. And we think the draft addresses this effectively as well. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify and look forward to questions. Thank you, Dr. Beinecke, very much. Our next witness is Ms. Meg McDonald, who is the Director of Global Issues for Alcoa. Uh, she has also served in Australia as Australia's Ambassador for the Environment, where she was the lead negotiator for the Kyoto Protocol and has advised several Australian government trade ministers. We welcome you, Ms. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you Mr. could uh, please turn on the microphone and move it a little bit closer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ch Chairman Waxman, Ranking Members Barton and Upton, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today as a member of the United States Climate Action Partnership, or USCAP. I'm here today to express Alcoa's support for comprehensive climate legislation this year. We and others in USCAP have welcomed the comprehensive approach taken in the American Clean Energy and Security Act. We, like uh, the other colleagues at this table that you've heard, believe that climate change is a global issue which requires leadership and immediate action from every sector of society. Alcoa is one of the world's largest producers of aluminum and alumina. We are active in all segments of the industry from mining, refining and smelting to rolling and extrusions with some 85,000 employees in 34 countries. The majority of our manufacturing base is here in the United States and two-thirds of our smelting capacity, representing 30,000 US jobs. The current global economic situation has meant significant and difficult changes in that manufacturing profile here in the United States and elsewhere. 
Aluminum is a globally and heavily traded energy intensive commodity for which the global price is benchmarked according to the London Metal Exchange. Since last June, we have experienced dramatic drops in global demand and the price of aluminum has dropped by more than 60%. Alcoa has put in place a detailed plan to weather the economic storm and with the hope of emerging stronger when the economy recovers. The energy intensive nature of, of primary aluminum smelting has meant that the location of aluminum production is driven by energy costs. It's also meant that the industry has been a leader in energy efficiency. We also believe that aluminum is part of the solution to climate change because of its properties of light weighting for transport solutions and because of its infinite recycling potential. Since 1990, Alcoa has reduced our own direct greenhouse gas emissions by 36%, and that's despite a significant increase in our production over that same period. Alcoa has been part of US CAP as a founding member and here today because we believe an economy-wide cap and trade program as part of a comprehensive US climate program can be constructed so as to minimize the impact on the economic competitiveness of US business and US businesses like Alcoa as we make a transition to a lower carbon economy. There's a broad consensus that the leakage problem must be solved to achieve effective climate legislation and we and our US CAP colleagues look forward to working to the, with the committee to achieve this. There's never been such a critical time for us to be focusing on this issue as many businesses like Alcoa, our workforce and our communities confront the very difficult challenges created by the current economic downturn. During the evolution towards a comprehensive global emissions trading regime, transition arrangements for energy intensive trade exposed sectors like ours will be necessary to protect our competitiveness and our employees' jobs. It'll be essential to protect the employment base and contribution to the US economy that industries such as aluminum, steel, chemicals, glass and paper represent. And we think the most important way of doing this is through the allocation process, as well as additional complementary measures. US CAP set out our own detailed thinking on the importance of inclusion of these in climate legislation uh, in our blueprint. And we've included in that additional cost containment measures, such as offsets and banking, the technology program, international linking of trading, and movement to a global system. Importantly, we also believe there should be specific credit for early action by companies such as ours, which have been reducing our emissions voluntarily. Alcoa believes that a cap and trade program that follows this approach will be successful in reducing emissions, whilst shif avoiding shifting jobs, investments and emissions from the US to other nations. This sort of leadership from the United States is essential to setting the stage for reaching global agreement on climate change. We also believe that a climate change framework established on this basis will bring a new vision and policy direction which will spur innovation through the US economy and elsewhere. And we think if we act wisely and swiftly, this will assist in restoring growth, increasing jobs and providing the means for America to be a global leader in low carbon technology. Chairman Waxman and Markey, Alcoa joins our other US colleague, CAP colleagues in looking forward to working with you, the subcommittee and the committee in your objective of reporting a comprehensive and effective energy and global warming bill to the United States House of Representatives by Memorial Day. Thank you, Ms. McDonald, very much. And our next witness is Mr. David Crane. He is the President and CEO of NRG Energy. Uh, Mr. Crane has been the President and CEO of NRG, a wholesale power generation company since December of 2003. Uh, we welcome you back, Mr. Crane, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. Well, thank you, Chairman Mar uh, Markey and Chairman Waxman, uh, Ranking Member Barton and, and Upton. Uh, Chairman Markey, as you mentioned, we're a competitive power generation company or wholesaler, as you say. We produce approximately 70 million megawatt hours a year, and like others in our industry, we do it in as a safe, inexpensive, and environmentally benign manner as, as, as post-war technology permits. And when I talk about post-war, in this case, I'm talking about post-World War II technology permits. But as global concern over climate change has grown, the management, employees, and possibly most importantly, the shareholders of NRG 
are aware that we have a moral imperative to reduce substantially the carbon intensity of our electricity production. Today I welcome the opportunity to appear at your committee as you begin consideration of whether there should be an economic imperative aligned alongside that moral imperative to reduce emissions. And I want to also offer you three general observations. First, combating climate change is inextricably linked to our country's future energy usage and to a national energy policy. And the best answer lies in the center where both environmental protection and energy security can be enhanced while avoiding the prospect of short to medium term dislocation to the economy. This in my mind is the fundamental principle upon which U.S. CAP was founded and it informs virtually all the recommendations set forth in the U.S. CAP blueprint. The shared concern of five environmental groups and 25 major American corporations led over the course of two years to a carefully calibrated and interlinked set of recommendations. As such, we believe all members of the committee should carefully consider these recommendations, whether you are more motivated by reducing emittances of carbon in the atmosphere or by reducing remittances of American wages and wealth to the Middle East in order to pay for foreign source fossil fuel. My second major point is that the potential embedded within climate change legislation for regional wealth transfer and value destruction is real but can be effectively addressed with a sensible balance between auctioned allowances and allowances allocated on an interim basis and with complementary measures for clean coal and other core technologies, including new advanced nuclear projects. Wind, solar efficiency, and smart meters are all worthy technologies that our company is investing in, and they all deserve government support. But the fact is that they, if you run the numbers, it's nearly impossible to see how we win the battle against climate change without the successful demonstration and global deployment of clean coal technology and advanced nuclear plants. The transitional partial uh, allocation approach with, with which Francis uh, referred to will help drive these investments as well as easing regional imbalances. It will give emitters like us a financial runway of sufficient length to gain lift in our efforts to innovate and invest in low carbon technologies that are critical to success in the fight against global warming. This is important because carbon will not be conquered just through increased funding of the nation's research. It will be conquered when companies in the electricity sector like Duke and NRG lead the way in demonstrating cutting edge low carbon technology at scale and deploying it en masse. To illustrate, in 2006, NRG announced a plan to invest up to $15 billion in 10,000 megawatts of new low and no carbon projects in this country. Since that announcement, we've made significant advances and in major investments in wind, solar, uh, uh, CCS, and advanced nuclear development. We all, we're doing all this as part of our philosophy that NRG wants to be a first mover in the technologies, the projects, and the businesses that will be spawned by sustainability and climate change. Third and finally, the electricity industry currently is the largest emitting sector in the United States, but as it decarbonizes, it will become a central part of the solution, both in our ability to export our new technologies to electric industries in other emitting nations and in our ability to displace other forms of carbon producing energy in other sectors in this country. At the center of our fossil fuel energy based society right now are the car, the high voltage transmission system and the base load power plants that feed it. Congress is in a position right now to alter fundamentally and for the better each of the three, but the electric car, the smart grid and low to no carbon base load power and, and by base load power again I'm emphasizing clean coal and advanced nuclear, they need to be advanced together as part of a coherent and co coordinated national energy and environment policy. And I, and I believe it's exactly right to base that energy and environmental policy on a free market-based system like the cap and trade uh, approach contemplated by the, the, uh, the, the Waxman Markey discussion draft. That will enable us to unleash the power of our free market system on this issue. And even in the weakened state of the American economy, as an unabashed capitalist, I'd say American capitalism remains the most potent peacetime force for a change on this planet. To do this, if we do this, I think all of us need to work again to define and find the common ground in the center. If we succeed, I'm convinced that when the history is written of our age, it will be said that the, the first giant leap for mankind into the post-hydrocarbon age began in the ninth year of the third millennium when the United States Congress pointed the American public away from consuming the Earth's resources in a non-sustainable way. 
so that the life experience that all of us have enjoyed will be enjoyed equally by future generations of Americans. Thank you, Chairman Lee. Thank you, Mr. Crane, very much. Uh, and we thank all of you.